Hello, I am Sam, and this is Sam's MCAT Basics. This podcast covers the most important topics put out on the AAMC MCAT each year, and I determine this list by going through all the official practice materials that the AAMC puts out, and also some third-party practice material, and just put together this big list of topics that consistently kept on showing up, and um, ranked those topics and um, made podcasts out of it. And so this podcast covers the nervous system. And the nervous system will show up in three of the four MCAT sections. It will show up in the chemical and physical foundations of biological systems, biological and biochemical foundations of living systems. And lastly, it will be found in the psychological, social, and biological foundations of behavior section. And this podcast will cover... Uh, quite a few different topics related to the nervous system. I'll go through the structure of the brain. I'll talk about neurotransmitters and imaging techniques to look at brain structure and function. And I'll go into how the brain functions in terms of the cells it uses, as well as action potentials. And eventually I'll get into brain disorders, drug dependence, and talk a little bit about the autonomic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. I hope this podcast aids in your studying. Enjoy. So the first thing I want to go over today is how the nervous system is organized. So it's broken down into two components structurally. That is the central nervous system, which are the brain and the spinal cord. And then you also have the peripheral nervous system, which is everything else outside of the brain and the spinal cord. Um, So these are like neurons, you know, projecting out of your spine to your arm, to your leg, so forth. Peripheral nervous system is further broken down uh, functionally. And these two branches are called the autonomic nervous system, which uh, control uh, involuntary things and the autonomic nervous system is further broken down into the sympathetic branch, which is the fight or flight, and the parasympathetic branch, which is the rest and digest. So easy way to remember the sympathetic nervous system is to think about a snake. So, you know, a snake makes a, makes a hissing noise like sympathetic. And so what's going to happen when a snake is coming at you? You're most likely going to be running or you're going to be trying to fight it, you know, fight or flight. So when you think about the example of a snake coming at you, think fight or flight. And that will remind you of sympathetic. The somatic nervous system is the other part of the peripheral nervous system. And this controls voluntary movements. So, you know, you give your friend a high five, you are using the somatic nervous system. So now that you have a basic idea of how the nervous system is organized, Uh, Let's talk a little bit about brain structure. Um, You're likely to see at least one or two questions about this on the MCAT. There are three primary portions of the brain. Uh, This includes the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. The forebrain is the forwardmost portion of the brain. This controls a lot of higher order functions like sleeping, eating, emotions. The forebrain includes two very important structures. Number one is the cerebrum. And number two is the limbic system, and I'll get in, in, uh, get into these in a little bit and talk about them. The next division of the brain is called the midbrain. And so the mid-brain, midbrain plays roles in vision, hearing, motor control, sleep, wakefulness, um, and also arousal. Um, and by arousal, I'm talking about um, being aroused by some stimulus. Um, the other arousal would be more controlled by the... Uh, cerebellum, if I had to guess. And um, an important structure within the midbrain is the substantia nigra. Um, it plays a role in dopamine, um, dopamine pathways, and is also a region that contributes to the progression of Parkinson's disease. Uh, both of these I will uh, touch upon further. And the last division of the brain is called the hindbrain, and it plays a very vital role. Um, supports vital bodily processes such as breathing, and it helps coordinate motor uh, 
movements and functions. And it has three main structures that you should recognize on the MCAT. That's the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the cerebellum. And so I'll talk about those a little bit more too uh, going forward. So now let's start with some of the functions of the cerebrum, which if you remember is in the forebrain. And so the cerebrum deals with functions like emotions, hearing, vision, personality, and much more. Uh, it also controls all voluntary actions. And so it is broken up into four distinct lobes. Uh, so the first lobe is called the occipital lobe. Um, and this corresponds to the visual processing centers, um, processing uh, basically what's coming into your eyes. And I remember this by thinking occipital optic. Uh, they kind of sound the same, and so that's how I remember that. The second lobe is called the temporal lobe, and that corresponds to auditory processing, so what you hear. And then the third lobe is called the parietal lobe, and so this is proprioception. And uh, what that is is just basically where you feel your body in three-dimensional space. Uh, and then also the parietal lobe has to do with sensation of pain, temperature, and pressure, and other forms of sensation. And then lastly is the frontal lobe. And so this is where the higher intelligence functions like disposition, personality, mood are um, highly regulated. And um, there's a good example of this in which um, you could see that losing the frontal lobe lost a lot of these functions, and that's the example of Phineas Gage, who was a rail railroad worker who um, basically was impaled through his frontal lobe and um, was still able to live just fine, but his disposition, disposition changed quite a bit. Um, he His personality completely changed. And this is an example that is given a lot in intro psychology courses. So you have most likely heard of it if you've taken psychology. So again, just let me go over a quick way to have some of these memorized easily. So you hear occipital, think optic, um, parietal, proprioception, keep the P's together, um, frontal lobe, and temporal lobe, you're kind of on your own. But once you have those two, you can kind of just um, think about that a bit easier, hopefully, and it's easier for you to memorize. Another important structure within the forebrain are the ventricles. And so these are basically cavities within the brain that are filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And these help distribute cerebrospinal fluid throughout the brain as well as cushion the brain during events that put pressure on your brain, um, like car wrecks, um, etc. And right below the cerebrum and kind of to the sides of, or in the middle of the ventricles, you have the corpus callosum, which is a very cool sounding word. It is Latin for tough body. And the corpus callosum is a thick band of nerve fibers that divides the cerebral cortex lobes into a right and left hemisphere. And it connects the left and right sides of the brain, which allows for communication between these hemispheres. Um, so it transfers, you know, mo motor, sensory, cognitive information between these hemispheres. An interesting theory put out there in 2001 essentially says that language learning is easier because this corpus callosum is not fully formed um, when you're young. And so basically he goes on to say that this allows different for different communication between language and processing centers in the brain. Um, now, of course, this is controversial, but uh, just an interesting uh, thing that or a role that the corpus callosum may play. Another structure within the forebrain is the thalamus. So the thalamus has multiple functions. Uh, generally, it's believed to act as a relay station, uh, basically receiving information from different subcortical areas in the cerebral cortex and um, relaying that information onward in the brain to different parts of the brain. Um, in particular, every sensory system includes a thalamic nucleus, that basically receives this sensory in input and then sends it to the associated primary cortical area within the brain. For the visual system, for example, um, you have inputs that are from the retina. They're sent to the lateral genucleate nucleus of the thalamus, uh, which in then in turn projects those to the visual cortex, which is again in the occipital lobe.
So the midbrain has one important structure called the substantia nigra that you should know. Mainly just recognize it, mainly recognize that it has to do with Parkinson's disease. Um, I think that's the only midbrain structure that I ever saw going over any of the MCAT practice materials that I did. The cerebellum is the first hindbrain structure that you should know. Uh, it serves a few different purposes. Number one, it smooths motor control. Animals and humans with cerebellum dysfunction show problems with motor control, and these are usually on the same side of the body as the damaged part of the cerebellum. And they continue to be able to generate motor activity, but they lose the motor precision and they produce erratic, uncoordinated, or incorrectly timed movements. And so ataxia is one of the main symptoms associated with uh, loss of cerebellum control. And so this kind of looks like someone being drunk, someone stumbling around, you know, imagine one of your drunk buddies, um, they, they have no body control, right? You're carrying them home from the bar. You got their arms slumped over you because they have no control over um, these kind of fine functions. They can still walk, but they just really don't have much control over these smooth functions. The medulla oblongata is another one of the hindbrain structures. This is involved in other autonomic involuntary functions, uh, stuff like cardiac respiratory uh, regulation, as well as vomiting, sneezing, heart rate. Um, so it has a, a, a wide range of controls. The last structure that you should know within the hindbrain is called the pons. And so this was named after an Italian anatomist and surgeon. Um, and this region of the brain basically contains uh, tracks of neurons that run up to the thalamus, which again is the relay station, um, which then s the thalamus sends these projections out to different parts of the brain for processing. So really it kind of acts as an intermediary um, on the way to the thalamus. It's also been speculated that the pons plays a role in generating dreams, which is kind of interesting. So now that you have a brief overview of the structure of the brain, I'm going to go into some of the imaging techniques, you know, how do scientists study the brain, um, what are these medical devices that are used to image the brain, look for tumors, look for um, different dysfunction of different areas of the brain. So there are three main categories of imaging techniques of the brain. The first is structural only. So these are only capable of looking at the structure of the brain. Next, you have functional only. And these are capable only of looking at the function of the brain. And then you have structural and functional imaging, which are capable of both um, elucidating the structure and the function of the brain. So the structural techniques include CT scans, also called computed tomography scans or computed axial tomography scans, which is CAT scan. So for the record, CAT scan, CT scan, same thing. Uh, don't confuse them. The other kind of structural imaging technique that you'll need to know is the MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. And so CT scans use differential absorption of x-rays and uh, MRI uses strong magnetic and radio waves to generate images of different parts of the body, um, including the brain. And so it is important to know um, what the source of the imaging is or, or how these things are imaged. So just remember CT scan x-rays while MRI uses magnetic and radio waves. Now onto the functional only. So these include the EEG, which is also known as the electroencephalogram. And so what that does is it measures directly the electrical activity of the brain. And then next you have the MEG, which stands for magnetoencephalography. And so the MEG measures the magnetic field that is produced by the electrical, electrical activity within the brain. Um, that's, a, that's a physics lesson in itself, um, why an electric current generates a magnetic field. Um, and also I think there is a new movie out about uh, the MEG imaging technique. So uh, yeah, make sure you see that. Lastly, here we have 
the imaging techniques that can measure both structure and function in the brain. So the first is called an fMRI, which stands for functional MRI, which basically measures oxygen consumption within different regions of the brain and therefore can um, look at activity within different regions of the brain um, as these regions consume oxygen. And then similarly, you have a PET scan, which stands for positron emission tomography. And this works on the same um, basic principle as an fMRI. Um, instead of using oxygen or measuring oxygen consumption, instead it's measuring glucose consumption. So essentially you are injected with radioactive glucose, and then uh, that radioactive glucose is basically tracked into your brain and the consumption of it is measured in different parts of the brain corresponding to which part of the brain is active um, and that's the part of the brain that's metabolizing the sugar. All right so next I'm going to get into neurons and look um, smaller scale at the brain and how it works. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is neuron structure. Uh, pretty basic stuff, but nonetheless important. So first you have the dendrites, and these are branch-like structures that basically extend away from the cell body. And what they do is they receive messages in from other neurons on the outside and allow these messages then to travel from uh, the tips of the dendrites into the cell body. And each of these dendrites has what is called dendritic spines. And so these act basically to increase the surface area so then each neuron can interact with more neurons. Next, you have the cell body of the neuron. And so this is kind of like other cells. Um, a cell must have a nucleus, smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, a Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, other components um, in order to live and to function. Um, and then you have the axon, and so the axon is a long structure, kind of tube-like, that carries electrical impulses from the cell body uh, to the opposite end of the neuron, which contains um, axon terminals. And so these axon terminals then uh, basically elicit this signal to other neurons um, that it synapses with. And so a synapse is the next portion of the neuron that I'm going to talk about. And the synapse is just the chemical junction between the axon terminals of one neuron and the dendrites of another neuron. And I'm going to get more into detail on synapses and neurotransmitters and stuff because that is uh, very important for the MCAP. But first, let's talk about how signals are transduced down a neuron. So you have these signals coming in in the dendrites. Uh, they make their way to the cell um, where they are summed at the axon hillock. So, you know, some of these might be inhibitory, some might be excitatory. Some right at the axon hillock, which is the part of the cell body that's right before the axon. And if these signals summed together are strong enough to depolarize the axon, you get a action potential. So let's go into action potential a little bit. When the axon is just hanging out, it has a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. And so in order for the action potential to be fired, a neuron has to get its membrane potential above negative 55 millivolts. And so um, these signals that come in can depolarize this membrane potential, i.e. get it down um, and then as soon as you get that resting membrane potential from negative 70 to negative 55, you get an action potential. And so an action potential is just simply a signal that moves down the axon. And this is what, uh, how our body messages is in the brain. Uh, pretty crazy that our thoughts really are just these action potentials going back and forth, our movements, everything um, in our body is coordinated by signals that are moving through our axons. So there's a few important events to uh, know in terms of an action potential. So um, there's a few different channels that open. Uh, 
uh, different ion movement, and so I'm going to go over that real fast. So your, your axon membrane sitting at negative 70, and then all of a sudden you get a few signals, a few stimuli that come in, uh, you raise your membrane potential, but boom, you know, you get to negative 60, not, not high enough. Um, eventually, you get enough excitatory signals that you reach a threshold, negative 55 millivolts, and depolarization happens. So during depolarization, voltage-gated sodium channels open, and these this positive ion sodium flows into the axon, which depolarizes that section of the membrane, right? Because these positive ions are flowing in, um, you're getting a more positive membrane potential. As these sodium ions flow in, you eventually reach a membrane potential around positive 40 millivolts. And at this point, the voltage-dependent uh, sodium channels close, and the voltage-dependent potassium channels open. And so potassium is located inside the cell, and now it flows down its electrochemical gradient and from inside of the cell to outside of the cell. And this basically restores the uh, negative membrane potential and results in hyperpolarization. And so that's when the membrane potential in the axon actually goes quite a bit below negative 70. And at this point, the voltage-dependent potassium channels close and potential is then restored. And so to restore the membrane potential, basically you have to restore the potassium and sodium concentrations within the axon. And so what happens is the um, you have to use energy to do this. So you get to use a, a K plus, Na plus, or sodium potassium ATPase. And so what that does is that uses ATP to pump these potassium back into the cell and pump the sodium out of the cell. And then you get back to that resting potential. And so this occurs basically all the way down the axon. One thing that's kind of interesting and I'll touch on real fast is these um, axons are covered in what's called myelin sheath. And so this myelin sheath basically acts as an insulator, similar to what um, rubber does around a wire. It basically makes sure that you don't lose any of that um, action potential as it travels down the neuron. And so myelin is um, basically forms these tube-like structures, and so it's not, it doesn't go all the way down the axon. There's actually these distinct different parts of the myelin, and so parts where there are not myelin are called nodes of Ranvier, and so basically you can think of the the action potential as jumping between these nodes of Ranvier, and um, it, this really helps speed up signals. Multiple sclerosis is a disease in which the immune system attacks the myelin sheaths and it causes communication problems between your brain and the rest of the body, it slows down these signals and can lead to a variety of symptoms, some of which really affect people, um, leaving them, you know, either wheelchair bound or bed bound. And something that I've seen quite a few different places on uh, different study materials for the MCAT is the type of cells that produce myelin. So there's two different types of cells. There's Schwann cells, and those are in the peripheral nervous system, and there's oligodendrocytes, which are in the central nervous system. So definitely know which goes with which. There's a good mnemonic that I use, OC. You can remember that original content, kind of like OG, but OC. And you can remember that oligodendrocytes go with the central nervous system. Just remember OC, OG, uh, not too bad. So now back to the discussion on the propagation of these action potentials. So the action potential jumps between these nodes of RAMVA, jumps down to the end of the axon when it reaches the axon terminals. And at this point, neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic cleft. And these are this is just the gap between um, the nerve terminals on one side and the dendrites on the other side. And so these neurotransmitters are released into the cleft and these send a chemical signal to the other neuron that then propagates that signal to that neuron. So now let's talk a little bit about these neurotransmitters that are released upon the action potential getting to the end of the neuron. Um, 
So I'm going to give you the main uh, neurotransmitters here. The first is GABA or glycine. Excuse me, GABA and glycine. They are distinct neurotransmitters. Um, I'm going to discuss them together because they have similar properties. GABA stands for gamma aminoburitic acid. And so this is a inhibitory neurotransmitter and very related to GABA and maybe people say it is GABA, I'm not really sure. Um, but uh, nonetheless, another neurotransmitter related to GABA is glycine and they're related in the fact that they're both inhibitory and they both downregulate anxiety. Next is the neurotransmitter glutamate. So glutamate is involved in learning and memory. And next you have peptide uh, neurotransmitters. And so these are more known as neuromodulators. Uh, essentially what they do is they influence the excitability of a neuron. So they'll either make a neuron, you know, for the same level of action potential that's being brought through. It'll make them more excitable. And it'll make it be able to um, have an action potential easier or harder depending on the peptide. There's also uh, serotonin, which I'm sure you've heard of. This regulates mood, pain, uh, sleep, appetite, and also intestinal movements. And kind of an aside is many of the medications to treat depression are SSRIs, which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what exactly that means uh, just know that these drugs that treat depression deal with serotonin, the neurotransmitter. And again, serotonin has been involved or been shown to be involved in depression, uh, which makes sense because it regulates mood. And so the next neurotransmitter I'm going to talk about is dopamine. And so dopamine is related to uh, movements in posture, uh, smoothest movements out, and also plays a role in dependency. And so you can think about drugs when you hear dopamine because the dopamine plays a role in becoming dependent to drugs and therefore becoming addicted. You can think about the role it plays in movement and posture by thinking about Parkinson's disease. And so you've seen someone in Parkinson's disease, um, they get these very rapid, shaky movements, and that's because of a dysregulation in dopamine. Next are the neurotransmitters known as norepinephrine and epinephrine. And so these are involved in the sympathetic response. Remember, sympathetic snake. And um, so, yes, fight or flight. And the last is acetylcholine. And this is acetylcholine is involved in muscle contraction. And so this is the main neurotransmitter at neuromuscular junctions, or basically between um, the nerves that project to muscles and the muscle itself. And so, you know, a question might become then, what happens to these neurotransmitters after they are released? Do they just stay there? What, are they, what do they do? Where do they go? And so there is three main ways in which these neurotransmitters leave the synaptic cleft. The first is reuptake. And so this is when the presynaptic neuron or the neuron that's going into the synapse basically just reuptakes all these or they, they take back all these uh, neurotransmitters. And so if you remember earlier, I was talking about SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And so as I said, I would get to that. And so what's going on here is the drugs, the SSRIs are preventing this reuptake and therefore there is more, there's more of the serotonin in the synaptic cleft which results in more firing of the postsynaptic neuron, which makes you feel more happy in the case of depression. And keep in mind, this is a vast, vast simplification. If you know, you're listening to this, you're a brain expert, shoot me an email, and uh, I'd be happy to update the podcast and talk a little bit more about what exactly is going on um, and how SSRIs affect the brain. Another way that uh, these neurotransmitters leave the synaptic cleft is via enzymatic breakdown. Uh, so a good example of this is acetylcholine esterase. And so this takes acetylcholine and just breaks it down, therefore can't keep contracting a muscle. And then the third way in which a neurotransmitter leaves the synaptic 
cleft is just the simplest way, which is diffusion. It just moves away from the synaptic cleft. All right, so now that I'm finished talking about neurotransmitters and the structure of neurons, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about language processing, also another very important topic on the MCAT. So <clears throat> language processing um, takes place in the dominant hemisphere of the brain, which is usually the left side. And there's a few very important areas in which language processing takes place. Uh, the first is Wernicke's area. Uh, the next is Broca's area. Wernicke's area is important for language development. It's located in the temporal lobe on the left side of the brain and is uh, responsible for comprehension of speech and understanding speech. And Broca's area, in contrast to Wernicke's area, is located in the frontal lobe. And it functions in the production of speech. And so the way that scientists and psychologists originally were able to figure out what the functions of these areas were is to see people that had injuries in these areas. And so I'm going to play for you some audio of a individual who is suffering from Broca's aphasia. Uh, it's very interesting stuff. Ready, go. Can you tell us your name? I, Mike Caputo. And Mike, when was your stroke? I was um, seven years ago. Okay. And... And what did you used to do? Um, well, um, worked um, Autodesk um, seven, seven sales. sales, sales and worldwide and very good, yeah. Okay, and who are you looking at over there when you turn That's your head? That's my wife. Okay, and why is she helping you to talk? Um, she's a speech. Um, so you have trouble with your speech? Yeah, yeah. And what's that called? Um, phasia. All right. So as you can see, it um, basically seems like this man has uh, the words on the tip of his tongue all the time, which would be a very frustrating disease to have. And so Wernicke's area can also be affected um, and be injured, which is called Wernicke's aphasia. Um, and these symptoms include the inability to grasp, grasp the meaning of spoken words and um, also of sentences. However, unlike the example of Broca's aphasia, the production of speech is not very effective. I'm going to play for you a video. You can kind of get a good idea. I guess you won't be able to see it. You'll be able to hear. I'm going to play for you some audio. You can kind of hear exactly what's going on. Uh, very interesting. And here we go. Hi, Byron. How are you? I'm happy. Are you pretty? You look good. <laughs> what are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talked with the people up with them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. They'll save in the moment. He'll have water very soon for him. With luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to we get to We will sort it right here and they'll save their hands right there for and, them. And what were we just doing with the iPad? As you can see, Wernicke's aphasia affects the production of uh, speech and that makes sense. The production of speech itself is not affected as with Broca's aphasia. There's another structure in the brain that plays an important role in language, and that is called the arcuate fasciculus um, that connects Broca's region to Wernicke's region. And so an injury that impairs this connection is called a conduction aphasia. And the symptoms of conduction aphasia are uh, the inability to repeat speech that is heard. And so, you know, an example of this might be a clinician speaking to a patient telling them, okay, repeat exactly what I'm saying, and that a patient, um, that patient then has trouble and struggles with the ability to repeat that language to the clinician. Now that I've talked about the language processing centers in the brain and some of the, the disorders that go along 
uh, with those areas, I'm going to go on and talk about some more brain disorders that you will likely see on the MCAT. So I'm going to go over the five most common neurological disorders that you're going to see on the MCAT. Uh, the first is schizophrenia, then Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, depression, and last but not least, I'm going to go over Korsakoff syndrome. Schizophrenia is the first disease I'm going to go over. And so I'm going to start out here talking about the symptoms. And so there's three main symptom categories in schizophrenia. Number one is positive symptoms. Number two is negative symptoms. And the third is cognitive symptoms. And so positive symptoms are symptoms that are added on to your normal behavior. They're in addition to your normal behavior. Um, and so in schizophrenia, these are hallucinations and delusions. And then there's negative symptoms. And so this is things like blunted emotions, withdrawal, and negative emotion or negative symptoms are things that draw from your normal behavior or they take away from your normal behavior. So, you know, you're withdrawing from your friends, um, stuff like that. And then last is the, is the uh, cognitive symptoms that go along with schizophrenia. And these are being uh, messy and disorganized or having trouble paying attention. And these are just abnormal cognitive functioning. It is also important to note that these cognitive symptoms are the biggest predictor in terms of um, looking and predicting if someone is going to have full functionality that has schizophrenia. Positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia aren't as big of predictors in determining if someone is going to be a very functional human being while, uh, while having schizophrenia. Another interesting characteristic of schizophrenia is the fact that is it is an early onset disease. And so most people are actually diagnosed by the time they are around the age of 18 or 19 years old. Um, so late adolescence and early adulthood are the peaks for the onset of schizophrenia. It's also important to understand the biological basis for schizophrenia. And so it's part of it is known to be genetic or hereditary there's a pretty big link between your relatives having schizophrenia and you having schizophrenia. Um, also, in the brain, people with schizophrenia tend to have increased dopamine and tend to have thinner cerebral cortexes and also, in general, have a reduction in total tissue size of the brain. And it's not necessarily known that these brain abnormalities are necessarily cause uh, more than a symptom of schizophrenia. That's still a, a place of ongoing research. So the next disease I'm going to talk about is Alzheimer's. The disease symptoms itself are, are very variable. A person with Alzheimer's can live typically four to eight years after diagnosis, but some, are live, some can live up to about 20 years. It just depends on a lot of different factors. Uh, but overall, the disease pr progresses from mild to late stage in the following manner. So in the early stages of Alzheimer's, a person usually can function relatively independent. Eventually, you know, they start having memory lapses, uh, forgetting familiar ro uh, words or, you know, where they live, friends, family members, um, just kind of basic everyday things they start to forget. And then it starts to progress further, and at which point people begin to be very forgetful about their own history. They experience changes in their physical abilities, such as being able to walk. And eventually it can progress to the point where they no longer have their involuntary uh, control over their muscles, no longer uh, functions, and that can result in death. Obviously, if you can't breathe or your, your heart stops beating, um, it's not a good thing. And pneumonia is actually one of the leading causes of death for people that have Alzheimer's just because they uh, have their ability to swallow is impaired and they end up improperly getting bits of food or 
drink into the lungs, which um, is not good and causes pneumonia, and um, a lot of people end up dying that way. Still, the most important thing to understand for the MCAT is the biological basis for Alzheimer's disease. And so there's two main pieces to this biological basis that you should know. The first is the beta amyloid plaques. These beta amyloid plaques form from the breakdown of a larger protein called the amyloid precursor protein. And so when these are break, broken down, uh, they form these highly insoluble aggregates that basically deposit in the brain, uh, usually between neurons, and they actually mess with the cell-to-cell -cell communication between these neurons, which leads to a lot of the symptoms you see with Alzheimer's, uh, a lot of the memory loss. And these plaques, once they start to form, they form uh, faster and faster, which is why you see such a degradation in someone's cognitive abilities as the disease progresses. Another biological marker in the brain of Alzheimer's disease are called neurofibrillary tangles. And these neurofibrillary tangles form in a similar manner to how the beta amyloid plaques form. Um, so these, f these tangles form when uh, tau, the protein, a protein called tau starts to aggregate together and basically what happens is in normal circumstances this, this tau protein stabilizes microtubules that run the length of the axon and so what happens when someone has Alzheimer's is that these tau proteins become aggregated and these microtubule, microtubules are no longer stabilized and they begin to disintegrate and so what normally happens is these microtubules within the neurons function to uh, basically regulate transport from one side of the neuron to the other. And it's important to mention that uh, both amyloid plaque formation as well as the neurofibrillary tangle formation are topics of research today. So uh, nothing's necessarily settled. Um, the science isn't necessarily settled. A lot of this is ongoing research as to how these events start and how exactly they proceed. Uh, but what is known is these are two very classic hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. All right, so moving on now to the next disease, um, we'll talk a little bit about Parkinson's. Parkinson's typically presents itself as uncontrollable muscle tremors, um, also stiff muscles or trouble moving your muscles. And so, you know, the classic example is um, someone trying to eat cereal with a normal spoon, but they, they can't because they, they stick the spoon in, they try to bring it up to their mouth, but they have such bad tremors that, um, you know, the cereal, the milk is going everywhere. And so there's, again, there's two main um, hallmarks to this disease that you should understand in terms of biology. The first is there's a change or loss of neurons that make up the substantia nigra. And so the substantia nigra is a part of the midbrain, and it plays a big role in reward and movement. And in Parkinson's, what happens essentially is that neurons within the substantia nigra uh, die and form these kind of black blotches, if you were to look at it under a microscope slide. And so this is known as discoloration of the substantia nigra, or darkening of the substantia nigra. And the other, the other thing you should know about Parkinson's in terms of biological basis um, is the formation of Lewy bodies. And so Lewy bodies are these formations of, or these aggregates of protein that form inside of nerve cells, again, leads to nerve death. Um, and, and these these aggregates form from a protein that's called alpha-synuclein. And the next neurological disorder I'm going to talk about is depression. And I think depression, at least when I was studying, is the most complex of these in terms of different uh, biological things that are going on in the brain, as well as the range of symptoms. So symptom-wise, depression 
usually it takes a form of a persistent feeling of sadness or loss of interest uh, and can range from changes in sleep and appetite to energy level, concentration, daily behavior, self-esteem, and it can also be associated with thoughts of suicide. And there's a few different symptoms that are worth noting, um, and I've grouped them in terms of things that are decreasing in the brain, things that are increasing in the brain, and then things that are abnormal in the brain. And so I guess you could you can consider decrease or increase abnormal, but by abnormal I just mean different, not necessarily increase or decrease. So for the decreasing wise, frontal the frontal the size of the frontal lobe decreases as well as a lot of different neurotransmitters decrease. Um, and these neurotransmitters are things like epinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. And I talked earlier about uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. And then um, next, you see an increase in the size of the limbic structure, which is something I want to talk about next. Uh, you also see an increase in stress hormones, as well as an increase in glucose metabolism within the amygdala, which is a symptom of basically stress. And then lastly, uh, you see abnormal neuroplasticity, which is just a fancy word for the way that the neurons are hooked up to each other. And so last but not least is Korsakoff syndrome. And so Korsakoff syndrome is accompanied by memory loss and confabulation. And all confabulation is, is just a memory error. And it's defined as the production of fabricated, distorted, or misinterpreted memories about oneself or the world without the conscious in, uh, intention to deceive. And so people are usually very confident about a, con a confabulation. They think it's real when in reality it's not. And the cause of Korsakoff syndrome is very well defined. It's simply caused by a lack of vitamin B1, which is also called thiamine. And uh, thiamine in the form of thiamine pyrophosphate plays a major role in glucose metabolism. It acts as a cofactor for the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which I will get to metabolism a little bit later in a different podcast. And um, hopefully by the time you're listening to this, that one will be up and you can go check it out. All right, now on to the limbic system. So the first thing you have to know about the limbic system is the structures that are in the limbic system and involved in the limbic system. And so there's an easy mnemonic to remember these structures. It's known as hippo hat. And so the structures are the hippocampus, hypothalamus, amygdala, and the thalamus. And these are not all of the structures that are in the limbic system, uh, these are just basically the most important ones, the ones that you should know most for the MCAT. And so I'm going to go through each of these structures in the limbic system and just give you a brief overview of what exactly each one does and how that relates to the overall function of the limbic system. And so to start, it's good to have an idea of what the function of the overall limbic system is and overall the limbic system is involved with emotion, motivation, learning, and memory. It's a very important structure for a lot of our higher functions that we have as humans. So the first structure I'm going to talk about is the thalamus. So the thalamus essentially acts as a relay station for all your sensory information. So as you know, your sensory information from your eyes and your, your feeling from your hands come in, it relays these to different parts of the brain to be processed. So the next structure I'm going to talk about is the amygdala. And so the amygdala is commonly known as the anger center. Um, so when the amygdala, amygdala is stimulated, it uh, usually results in a anger or violent response as well as uh, f to invoke fear or anxiety. And when the, on the other hand, when the amygdala, amygdala is destroyed, it results in a mellowing effect. And although you might be thinking hey, didn't you just describe all the calibros? Is, is that what you're talking about? It's, it's not necessarily that. So what it more refers to is the fact that when you destroy the amygdala, it results in be people becoming 
hyper oral, uh, they won't like to put stuff in their mouth, hypersexuality, and also disinhibited behavior. So it's very similar to basically being, being drunk. All right, and the next structure I'm going to talk about is the hippocampus. And so the hippocampus um, is important because it converts memories that are in your short term into your long term memories. And so obviously this is important for emotions, for learning. You want to have, be able to remember certain situations in order to evoke an emotional response. And obviously has some evolutionary value as you want to be able to have an emotion elicited once you view some kind of stimuli. Um, you want to be able to remember that and then have these emotions elicited so you can act appropriately. Lastly is the hypothalamus. And so the hypothalamus basically connects the endocrine system to the nervous system. And so essentially what the hypothalamus does is it tells the pituitary to release hormones. And so this includes hormones like norepinephrine and epinephrine, um, which cause the fight or flight response, which obviously has a very large effect on your emotional state as these Hormones increase your heart rate, basically prepare you to either fight or to flight, if you remember from earlier when I was talking about hormones and their effects. So that's a little bit about the limbic system. I want to talk now about the structures of the brain that are related to addiction um, and then talk a little bit about different kind of drugs and their effect on different parts of the brain and what they do to the brain. So I'm going to give you an example of my buddy Mark who uh, smokes probably a good pack a day of cigarettes, which is, which is terrible, but uh, makes for a good example of addiction. And so, so the first structure I want to note here is the amygdala. And so when Mark's smoking, his amygdala, amygdala is forming an emotional response to that cigarette. And so he begins to sh associate those emotions with the cigarettes themselves. Uh, the next structure is called the nucleus accumbens and essentially what that does is it deals with the motor functions related to a specific addiction and so in the example of the cigarette um, this is the feeling of taking a jar the feeling of having something in your mouth um, that makes that attractive or makes has addictive properties and so the next or, or the next part of the brain involved with addiction is the prefrontal cortex. And so uh, the prefrontal cortex focuses attention. In this case, it's going to focus uh, Mark's attention on his cigarette as he takes a drag. And then last but not least is the hippocampus. And so as I talked about in the limbic system, the hippocampus converts short-term memories to long-term. And so in the example that I have presented, essentially what the hippocampus does is taking these memories of smoking and the feeling that you get from the buzz of nicotine and converting that short-term memory into a long-term memory so then you can retrieve that memory and remember what the feeling of that buzz feels like, and which leads, obviously, to addiction. And as you can see, there's quite a few structures that overlap between the limbic system and structures that involve addiction. So in the example I just explained, the cigarette was the drug. Uh, however, drugs can take on many different forms and have many different effects. So I'm just going to go through a few of those. First category of drugs are depressants. There's three major depressants. And um, the first is alcohol. Next is barbiturates. And the third is benzodiazepines. And what these do is they mimic uh, GABA activity in the brain, G-A-B-A, -A, which is the neurotransmitter that I talked about. And so if you remember correctly, um, the GABA neurotransmitter is a inhibitor or a, um, yeah, and it, it, it inhibits neural activity. And so um, because of that, it's it, it depresses your brain's neural activity. So you can just remember um, that depressants mimic GABA activity. Uh, the next are stimulants, and so there's three main stimulants, which are amphetamines, cocaine, and ecstasy, and so they have kind of the opposite 
effect as depressants, uh, they increase dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin levels in the synaptic cleft, which leads to stimulation of the brain, and people describe it as a feeling of euphoria. And the last major drug category are known as hallucinogens. And so LSD and uh, psilocybin, which is a uh, psychoactive compound in mushrooms, are both two common hallucinogens. And these have very complex mechanisms of action. I don't think you need to know that for the MCAT. And I know you might be thinking, okay, um, what about marijuana? You know, that's, that's, that's my favorite drug. How, do, how does that work? And so it's a more complex drug in, in the fact that it is a hallucinogen, a stimulant, and a depressant. And so being a complex or being a combination of all of these, it is a, has a very complex mechanism of action. And fun fact, contrary to common belief, marijuana actually impairs your sleep. I think a lot of people think that, you know, they get a better night's sleep if they smoke before they sleep. But in reality, it's it's just like alcohol in that it impairs your REM sleep or impairs you from reaching REM sleep and therefore is not great for your sleep. So that concludes this lesson of MCAT Top 20. Uh, thanks for taking a listen. I'm Sam and hope you listen to the next episode. All right, now for the MCAT advice of the day. So when you begin studying, I think it's a pretty good idea to take a few days before you study or right when you start studying to plan how you're going to study. Set, set a schedule for yourself. Um, you know, have, have that you want to get this far done in, you know, the study books you have or the courses you have or whatever. But... Um, yeah, and if you if you don't know what schedule you want to follow, uh, I recommend going to studentdoctor.net and looking up some of the schedules they have on there. One thing I found really helpful is you can go on there, uh, again, studentdoctor.net, and you can see these people that did well on the MCAT. You, they, they put down how they studied, when they studied, how long it took them. And from there, you can kind of compile a list of different ideas for studying, um, you can pull different aspects from people's study schedules and, and kind of create your own. That's what I did, and I think it worked pretty well for me. So again, what I recommend doing is before you even start studying, put together a schedule of how you're going to study, what you want to accomplish, and then hold to those goals. I think it helps you study and um, helps you stay focused. And also use these online message boards on, you know, you can even go to Reddit, studentdoctor.net, using them to kind of create a schedule of studying and come up with a good plan to make yourself study successfully for the MCAT. Come on, Murph. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to podcast over here, dude.